I can pray, Pastor. Yes, yes, please, Rose. Okay. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for the many ways you provide, you protect, and you preserve us. Thank you for your unending and unconditional love for all of us. Father, we thank you for the next hour of being in, in this school, and we devote and commit this hour to you. Father, we also ask that you uh, anoint Pastor Nancy with your words of wisdom as she speaks in your behalf. Inspire us inspire us and move us by your Holy Spirit as we listen and understand what we are about to hear. Inspire Pastor Nancy, guide us all by the light that comes from your word. Father, we ask this all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Rose, uh, for leading us. And once again, welcome. Good morning to uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in. So this morning, uh, I will begin with a quick recap of uh, our lesson on baptism because in the last class somehow we uh, i forgot to press record uh, or i don't know i thought i pressed record but something uh, happened uh, but the whole thing didn't get recorded so i'll just do a quick recap of baptism for the sake of our uh, e-learning uh, students or anyone else who is uh, connecting to the YouTube channel um, and after that you know we'll, I'll go into uh, the second sacrament of the church which is uh, communion so we said that there are two sacraments or these are uh, practices that are ordained for the church to follow uh, and these two that we still continue to keep uh, are water baptism and uh, the communion we see the first century church follow it and we do have clear instructions in god's word commanding us to continue these two practices we don't have any um, such uh, instruction for other practices uh, in fact uh, some of the practices that the jews had uh, those were not considered essential for the christians to keep for example circumcision you know, that's something that has significance uh, uh, in the old testament but we very clearly see that uh, the the elders of the church you know, they uh, gave an instruction they gave a uh, clarity that for a born again believer they no longer needed to follow that practice so similarly there are other practices that we can look at in the old testament under the old covenant which we, we might wonder if we must continue uh, but there is clarity on these two ordinances or practices because we see the first century church following it, even in the epistles, there is a reference to uh, things like water baptism, there is a reference to the Holy Communion, but other things we don't. So that is the reason we're talking only about these two ordinances. And in the last class, we said that water baptism, you know, it indicates one's repentance uh, and one's willingness to be part of God's kingdom. Uh, this, this, way of bringing people into the kingdom or inviting them to god we saw john the baptist practice it a lot uh, and that is why he was called john the baptist even jesus was baptized by john uh, we know that jesus had nothing to repent of but uh, as an act of obedience to the father jesus still um, underwent water baptism and he was you know, fully immersed in water and uh, the reason why he did that was to fulfill all obedience unto god uh, and we see that just the way jesus was baptized we as believers need to be baptized and there is a command uh, as per the great commission for us to go make disciples and baptize people uh, in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit this this act of getting baptized on one spot uh, uh, it is a decision that they are making to follow jesus christ for the rest of their lives uh, the act of baptism is also symbolic of what jesus went through jesus died uh, he was buried and he rose from the dead uh, romans chapter 6 verse 4 shows us that similarly 
spiritually you know, a believer has died to the old life uh, uh, you know has been buried with christ and also experienced that resurrection with christ as they come out of the water so it is symbolic of what the lord jesus went through a baptism also helps us have a clear conscience towards god that is something god has asked us to ask us to do and we obey it and whenever we obey god we can carry a clear conscience before god uh, what is the requirement for one to be what a baptist one needs to be born again you know it's as simple as that so they need to repent and believe uh, and uh, after that one can be what a baptist so we don't see too many prerequisites uh, strictly uh, telling people to do a lot of other things before they are what a baptist in fact uh, when you see the way believers uh, in the book of acts baptized people so somebody who was born again uh, a couple of hours ago somebody who was born again a few days ago they just went ahead and they baptized them in water because it's about that person confessing christ repenting of their old life and following jesus yes so that is all that is required for one to be water baptized water baptism has got to be immersion only we don't see any um, biblical basis for things like sprinkle baptism or you know uh, any other form of baptism it has to be immersion baptism the word baptism it's a baptism uh, it it means to be immersed or to be dunked or dipped uh, and therefore immersion is the way to go when we talk about water baptism uh we also must not um, uh, infer that one needs to become very mature spiritually or needs to be a spiritual giant in order for them to uh, be water baptized because you know we don't see that in scripture people didn't even wait the moment somebody believed they baptized them so one is baptized in water and then you know, uh the normal journey of of uh, walking with christ and growing uh, in god that needs to take place so uh, maturity it, it it's not required that one be very mature uh, you know for them to be water baptized and then uh, yes when we are water baptized we can expect supernatural things to take place we can expect answers to prayer because it's an act of obedience and we know that every time we obey god god's blessing comes upon our lives uh, and so yes there are testimonies when people were water baptized they uh, received breakthroughs but then there are uh, other testimonies where nothing dramatic happened but the point is that we have been commanded to follow water baptism and we are just being obedient to it so one of the good ways in which we can uh, follow this practice in our local churches is to um, invite people as soon as they believe you know invite them to be baptized one could choose a particular day uh, uh, in uh, in the month or you know as as it works for that local body Uh, pick a particular day and everyone who has believed on that particular day you could uh, take them if there is no source of water a uh, close by you could plan to go to a place where there is a tank or there is a river or something like that and then uh, by faith people can be baptized in water so, so that they are able to uh, in a in a sense you know they they are declaring they are declaring to the people that now they have become followers of the lord jesus christ and they are confirming that decision to follow the lord jesus christ um, and then uh, people are baptized we see that you know, we can baptize them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit as per some of the scriptures but in the book of acts uh, we see that people are baptized in the name of jesus you know either should be fine but just so we follow uh, both both the um or uh, you know instructions or recommendations uh, here at apc i i mentioned to all of us we say in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and you know i baptize you in jesus name so we just do it both ways uh, so that people who are coming from a certain background they don't feel like hey you didn't do it like this this is what it says in acts so this is what it says in matthew so we do it both ways um 
uh, and uh, yes, it's something that is to be done by faith by the person who is baptizing and uh, also the person who is being baptized. You know, you receive that by faith. And uh, baptism uh, is fine once because it's just a it's just a um, profession or acceptance of one's decision to follow Christ. And you know, we make that decision once. Right? Once we are born again. Uh, so one need not be baptized again and again. One baptism. And that is more than enough. Uh, and does uh, baptism, is baptism a prerequisite for someone to be born again? Uh, no, we don't see that. You know, uh, what if somebody is not water baptized for various reasons? You know, in the last discussion, we saw some people could be bedridden. You know, they cannot be dipped in water. Uh, what happens to a person's salvation then? Uh, we don't see scripture putting a, uh, like it's not a rule where if you are not water baptized and you're not going to uh, receive salvation. So uh, yes, in some instances, people who are born again are unable to be water baptized, but that does not affect their salvation. So these are all some of the points that the key points which we discussed in the last class. And we also uh, made this point that when it comes to the Holy Spirit baptism, the order in which one can be baptized in water, one can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, we don't see a prescribed order again in scripture. It could be either way. You know, one could be baptized first in the Holy Spirit and then be baptized in water or the other way around. So some of the uh, key things that we touched upon and I think that should uh, you know, cover all the basics about water baptism. So let's uh, move on from here. Today we will discuss about uh, the Lord's table. Okay. The Lord's table uh, is a, a practice where we partake of um, bread, which is representative of the body of Jesus, and uh, um, you know wine or grape juice, which is representative of the blood of Jesus. Now, who instituted the Lord's table? It's the Lord Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 26 from verses 18 through 30. And it'll be good if someone can just read that passage for us, please. Matthew 26 verses 18 through 30. Yes, ma'am. Matthew yes, 26, yes. 18 to, ma'am, 18 30. to? 30. And, and he said, go into the city to such a man and say to him, the master said, my time is at hand. I will keep the Pass Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dipped his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the wine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when they had sung an hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Susan. So, uh, yeah. So thank you so much for uh, going through that. Here we see the Lord Jesus in the Last Supper. Um, for the first time, he, he, uh, he, uh, I'm not sure if it's for the first time because, uh, even, yeah, 
because in john we we find that people were opposing the lord jesus for preaching something like this but anyway you know we we see that at the uh, last supper he goes ahead with the communion and he he talks about it being his body and his blood and he encourages the 12 disciples to uh, partake of it okay uh, so i just quickly come to a question here in the chat and this is uh, about baptism so uh, sorry for the you know uh, uh, interruption uh, in what i'm sharing about communion so charles is asking so sprinkling is not baptism uh yeah it has no biblical basis charles yeah so in other words no it's not baptism i hope uh, that's clear okay um yeah uh, let's let's move on so the lord jesus instituted um the the communion and um there was instruct there were instructions given by apostle paul to the corinthian church on how to partake of the lord's table now one interesting thing is when you read the accounts of uh, uh of um apostle paul and uh, his inst- uh, like you know the the way he instructs the corinthian church you will also see that he says that um he received revelation about communion uh basically from god so we know that he was never a part of those 12 disciples when jesus was around uh, and so he never saw jesus do it so and also he never really spent that much time with the apostles in jerusalem for him to learn everything you know about their practices uh, and he 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 says it he says it himself that i have received by revelation so by revelation god uh, gave him the understanding about the holy communion and based on that he instructs the believers so what are some of the key things about the holy communion that we must understand now the holy communion is once expression of their personal faith in the death the burial and the resurrection of the lord jesus christ so every time we partake of it you know it's not just an act or, or it's not just a ritual that the church follows but it's an expression of my faith each time i partake of the holy communion i'm saying i believe i believe in what the lord jesus has done no i believe that he has died for me on the cross i believe that he has a covenant uh, with me i believe that i am a recipient of that new covenant i believe you know that the blessings of the cross have come upon my life so it's an act of faith it's an expression of faith in communion uh, so it, it's really important it's really important uh, we could also say that communion it's a proclamation of our faith in the completed work of the cross so what we are saying is what needed to be done for our sins to be forgiven what needed to be done for us to receive abundant life the lord jesus has already done it on the cross of calvary there's nothing uh, additional that needs to be done to by our salvation so we proclaim that so when i'm partaking of the holy communion i'm saying you know the cross is enough the cross is our victory the cross is the power of god you know the cross is uh, everything Uh, and you know uh, the cross demonstrates god's love for us so basically uh, i am proclaiming through my act that i believe uh, in the lord jesus i believe in the work of the cross so that is the meaning of partaking of the holy communion now jesus also said you know you continue to do this till my return so when we partake of the holy communion just as much as we put our faith in what he has done on the cross we are also putting our faith in the fact that he is going to come back he is going to return for us uh, so in other words we we're seeing that this act is an expression of faith this act is a 
proclamation of what the Lord Jesus has done. Uh, and uh, this act is also expressing that uh, we are one with God. Okay, We are one with God. We have a communion with God. Communion is nothing but fellowship. Okay, This is nothing but fellowship. Uh, when we look at the tabernacle, one of the pieces of furniture in the holy place was that showbread table. And on that table, you know, uh, there, there was bread. And that is uh, symbolizing you know, God's desire to commune with man or God's desire to fellowship, have a relationship with man. So again, when we partake of the Holy Communion, it is like us expressing that union with the Godhead, with Jesus, uh, with you know the body and the blood uh, of the Lord Jesus. Communion, uh, if this is uh, based on 1 Corinthians 10, 16, we can also express our communion or our relationship with the body and the blood of Jesus. So we are fellowshipping. We are fellowshipping with God and we are saying, you know, I'm one with God. I'm one with God. And we are partaking of the Holy Communion. Now, the Holy Communion is also an expression uh, and a confession that we are a part of the body. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10, 17 says that, that we are a part of the body. So uh, we are saying, in other words, you know, so far, all the... Uh, statements that I've made, those are uh, confirming that we have a personal relationship with God. And you know we have a communion fellowship with God, a deep communion with God. Uh, so they are talking about our union with God. But the Holy Communion is also an expression of the Holy Communion is also an expression of our communion with other believers. Because what we're saying is, we're saying that we are part of the body. Okay? We are part of Christ's body. And there are uh, you know, others who are born again who are also part of the body. So we are saying that we are committed to unity in the body. We are committed to honoring the other members of the body. So it's about our communion with God. Uh, and it is about our communion with people, okay, believers, those who are in the body of Christ. So that is the meaning of the Holy Communion. Yeah, and therefore it uh, uh, gives us that we have this responsibility um, towards God and towards the people. So the way we live, the way we keep our relationships with others in the church, uh, in, in our fellowship, <coughs> in all the fellowships that we are a part of, you know, uh, uh, it matters because when we are partaking of the Holy Communion, we, we are saying that we are committed to the people of God as well. So that's about the Holy Communion. Now, we are also uh, told that Yeah, uh, so another point that I just want to add to this is, see, every time we talk about the cross, okay, uh, it's powerful because we're speaking of our victory. We're speaking of that um, uh, overcoming, you know, that the cross is accomplished for us. We're speaking about the authority that you and I can walk in. So it's extremely powerful uh, when we consider the cross or we talk about the cross and uh, just in line with that, when we are partaking of the Holy Communion, it's extremely powerful okay? uh, because we're talking about the victory of the cross. So when I partake of the Holy Communion, uh, what really happens? Every step of obedience brings God's blessings. So when I partake of the Holy Communion with the understanding of what this means for me, the blessings of the cross come upon my mind. So that is why we, we, we've heard so many testimonies when people partake of the Holy Communion. Uh, uh, somehow, you know, that one act of obedience, that one act of faith, you know, releases breakthroughs. People say, hey, I got healed. I, I uh, was oppressed by, by you know, some demonic spirit. I was set free. And I had this financial difficulty and 
you know i received uh, a phone call uh, you know uh, sort of like almost immediately after i i partook of the holy communion by faith so a lot of breakthroughs uh, people testify of that and we can expect in fact every time we partake of the holy communion we can expect the supernatural power of god to manifest the victories of god to manifest in our lives you know the provision of god to come uh, uh, you know breakthroughs to be released deliverance to happen healing to happen so uh, god is god is really meant for communion to be that act you know that that releases the power of the cross upon our lives so uh, it, it's it's never really do this never partake of the holy communion in a light way uh uh because there is so much uh that has been promised as we partake of the holy communion and another uh, uh i think that i want to add here is you know some people believe that when one partakes of the holy communion the elements whatever elements people use some people use uh bread some people use wafer some people use grape juice some people use actual wine you know some people just use water uh, here in india if there are uh, uh, local churches that cannot afford to buy bread or to buy wafer they just use our uh, regular bread like a chapati or something like that you, know, you tear that and you pray over it and you uh, consume it as communion now uh, do those do those um, materials uh, turn into the body and the blood of jesus because there is a concept called as transmutation where people believe that those uh, whatever you are you are taking in as communion it really becomes the body it really becomes the blood of jesus scriptures don't really tell us that that uh, if we don't have to worry about it it's an act of faith and uh, uh, if whatever we are consuming the way to do it is you will see you know uh, you, you sanctify it you bless it paul writes about it you sanctify it bless it and then you take it by faith so that's all okay that that's how it is done it's quite simple uh, and paul also instructs i'm not reading those two passages but you know you could go and uh, read it uh it's given okay uh, first corinthians chapter 10 and first corinthians chapter 11 uh the portions regarding communion you know there are a couple of instructions that paul gives there he says that one must partake of the lord's table in a worthy manner okay so what is, what does it mean to partake of the lord's uh, table communion is also known as the lord's table because when you eat at the table you're expressing your relationship with somebody so it's the lord's table uh he says that one must partake of it in a worthy man so uh, what does he what does he mean by that we knew that we know that the corinthian church uh he was trying to instruct the corinthian church for right living they were people who had come from a pagan worship background and uh, it is likely that some of them continued to uh, eat the food which was offered to idols as well as partake of the holy communion so basically he was saying that you know you cannot partake of both you have to uh, you have to be committed you have to be committed or you know you you need to pay pleasure allegiance to the lord jesus you can't put your foot there and here as well so make up your mind so that in that context you know he says okay partake of it in a uh, proper way uh, you can partake only of the holy communion and you cannot just go and also have uh, like express your commitment to other gods as well so that was one one uh, reason why he told them to do it in the right way the second reason is that the people the corinthian church when they would come uh for the holy communion apparently it would be something like a feast and people will get drunk you know those days uh there was no limitation of on how much bread and how much wine one could take you know today for the for the sake of uh, Uh, uh you know just to have a format that's easy to follow when crowds of people come in uh the church has made the consuming of the communion elements as you know, small portions so you just have a small portion of bread and uh, a small portion of the grape juice but in those days you know, people would get drunk and paul knew that that is dishonoring they were actually dishonoring so he tells them you if you really want to eat Uh, and uh, enjoy you do that at home no communion is not that you need to have a reverent heart because 
try to understand you're proclaiming the death the burial and the resurrection of the lord jesus you're proclaiming the victory of the cross you know upon your life upon the powers of darkness so it's a powerful thing that one is doing and we must honor the lord jesus for what he has done for us so in that context you know he spoke about us doing it in the right way doing it partaking of the holy communion in a worthy manner uh, so yeah we need to bear this in mind and uh, again when you talk about the prerequisite for the lord's table uh, it's only for a believer to be uh, only for a person to be born again so as long as one is born again they are invited to the lord's table we don't see uh, specific instructions that say one has to be water baptized to partake of the holy communion or one has to be uh, baptized in the holy spirit to partake of the holy communion you can just uh, you know partake as long as you are sure that a person is born again so here again at apc we say that if you are a believer in the lord jesus christ you are welcome to partake of the holy communion whenever we are having the uh, holy communion which is generally the first sundays that's how we practice here the first sunday of the month uh, is the communion uh, week and uh, yeah so it's done in that manner periodically so that's a little bit about the holy communion again if we have questions we will uh, we can dis discuss them any doubts or you know comments from your end i'm just looking at the chat here okay uh, so samil is sharing uh, an article supported with breaking is not bad and deba that people have who support sprinkling as baptism okay yeah thank you thank you samuel and uh, charles uh, you could probably refer to this article as well yeah uh, is that okay charles i didn't hear from you after you asked the question so i'm wondering whether you're on mute it is okay it is okay uh okay uh, i i yeah <clears throat> i was i was i was baptized twice because first was sprinkling but when i believed on the lord jesus christ i i had to go for immersion to declare yes. my obedience and the, and the submission to the lord jesus christ yes yeah yeah thank you charles so uh, uh even that is what is important our submission to the lord jesus okay uh so it, even if you know one is in this case you know charles is saying he was sprinkled uh with water uh, as baptism but even if an individual has been in, immersed uh in baptism but at that point one was not a believer Now, which has happened to a lot of people because just as uh, in some of the churches you know you have these ordinances that one needs to keep okay uh, a part of the holy communion be baptized then something else something else something else so it's just a very very uh, a sort of you know it's just part of the ritual you need to do certain things at certain points in your life and one does all of that uh, but that doesn't make one a believer so uh, let's say somebody has been through immersion baptism but it's only later that they the born again they would need to be baptized once again because baptism is also an act of faith so without faith when uh, one is baptized it doesn't count okay so if one is sprinkled baptized or uh, immersed uh, in baptism but they were not a believer it needs to be done again and uh, yeah any any other questions or thoughts so again for both water baptism and uh, communion uh, age if we talk about the age limit uh, as long as some you know that that child uh, is conscious that they are born again they have committed their life to jesus and they're going to follow the lord jesus it's their decision 
and they fully understand what what they are talking about they are born again uh, they can partake of the communion they can also be water baptized so there is no age limit it's hard to tell uh, what age one must be to uh, partake of both these uh, ordinances or practices okay, there are some good questions in our notes itself so you could go through that and it answers uh, some common questions so let me quickly see if there's something different here okay uh, can a believer baptize another believer what what do you think can a believer baptize another believer or should it only be the elders or the pastors who must baptize Well, I I know that uh, I think from the scripture that a believer can baptize another believer. Yes. Doesn't mean that yes. pastor or the elders are the one that can do it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, that's very correct. Um, in fact, we have examples. Uh, there is um, uh, who's that? Philip. Yeah, Philip, who was a volunteer at that point. You know, he's not called evangelist yet. Uh, and Philip baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, when God called the believer uh, in Damascus, uh, Ananias, to come and pray for, uh, you know, uh, to be Apostle Paul, he was just a believer, ordinary believer. He comes, he prays for uh, uh, Saul, and then he baptizes Saul. So these are just believers, Philip and Ananias. So. You know, it shows us that yes, believers can uh, can baptize other believers. Uh, yes, Charles, you have something to say? Yes, um, a believer who is a, who is the pastor? Isn't it the pastor believer? That is the first thing for someone to be a pastor must be a believer. So, a believer baptizing a believer. That is the right thing because I will not go to a witch doctor to baptize me because I don't believe what they believe. Therefore, a pastor is a believer. Then he will baptize another person who has not yet been baptized. So I think that is the right track to have mm -hmm. a believer baptizing a believer. Thank you. Okay, sure. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Charles. And uh, uh, on similar lines, Samuel says, yes, believer can baptize Kennedy. Yes, and Anita also. Yes, so yes, believers can baptize. Um, if there is an opportunity for a pastor to baptize, great. If not, uh, if there's you know just a believer around, by faith, one can baptize another believer. Now, uh, also the question here says, what if uh, one partakes of the communion in an unworthy manner? Because, you know, Paul says that, like, you check yourself, examine yourself before uh, you uh, do this. Will one, and then he says, you know, many are sick among you. Some have also, uh, you know, died. Uh, so it's a warning. It's a warning. So people ask the question, what if I, if I did something? You know, against God, and then I partook of the Holy Communion. Will I be struck dead? Uh, well, we don't see things like that happening uh, under the New Covenant. You know, there's just more grace extended to us. Uh, but still, you know, we must examine ourselves and we must uh, confess our sins. Okay, and uh, this is not to um, create fear in our hearts. If at, if at all we are aware of something in our lives which God is not pleased with, before we partake of the Holy Communion, in true repentance, genuine repentance, we can say sorry and then partake of the Holy Communion. So we can keep it as simple as that. And that should be all right. Uh, okay, now the other question here that... Uh, has been included in the notes is, should I partake of the Lord's table if the one ministering it does not have faith? Something that Charles uh, 
um, said just now, a believer baptizes a believer, that makes sense because both believe. Now, similarly, when it comes to communion, what if the person administering the communion does not have faith? You know, sometimes it happens that uh, uh, if, if, you know, I've gone out of uh, a city, I've gone to a particular place and I don't find a church, I want to attend a church and I go uh, someplace and for whatever reason, I, I feel like, okay, you know, uh, maybe the person who is doing the, leading the communion themselves is not believing in it or, or something like that. Then how can I partake of the Holy Communion? Uh, the, the answer to that is, see, if, uh, faith on the part of the one ministering the Holy Communion is very important. Uh, and we should, you know, look for that. But in, in case... You know, uh, one sees, like suppose, you know, it's a traditional church and the person themselves is not born again or something like that. Uh, then what do you do? But they are administering the Holy Communion. So in a situation like that, you know, what, when, when we are given the elements, uh, we can pray over it by faith and we can take it. If the main thing is faith. If there's no faith uh, in the act of communion, then it really doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't help. Okay? So this is the right way. So how to partake of the Holy Communion in the right way? To have faith when we do it. So just, uh, uh, you know, some, uh, some clarification there of how to go about it. Now, the other question that people generally ask is, can a believer take part of the Lord's table at home? Okay, so I think uh, people have been asking this question more recently because of COVID, you know, uh, unable to go to church, unable to have gatherings. In fact, uh, I met some uh, students, like, you know, I, we have some of these students whom we used to minister to. So once in a while, I just bumped into them. And they were telling me how they had not, uh, because of COVID, for like six months or seven months, they never took communion because they couldn't go to church. Uh, and they believe that only pastor has to pray and give it. Only then they will take it. So, uh, yeah, a lot of people believe that. So what is our opinion on that? Can one uh, partake of the Holy Communion at home? Will it be valid? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So Christopher says, yes. Uh, one example is uh, the book of Acts. We see about the early church that they broke bread. It says they broke bread house to house. So that in itself you know, gives us uh, the clarification. So they, they had their gatherings in the temple, but they also had these house meetings and they did partake of the Holy Communion at home. So that gives us, uh, yeah, that gives us uh, confirmation that it's okay. You know, it won't make our communion invalid. So those are all some of the common questions that arise. And I think we've touched on it. If there are no more questions, then we can uh, directly proceed to the next chapter here, which is about church discipline. Any thoughts? Okay. Yes, Christopher. So Christopher is asking, can we celebrate the Lord's table um, more regular basis, like daily basis? Yes, we can. Because again, if you look at the book of Acts, uh, it says like, you know, they met house to house, broke bread daily. So uh, the frequency has not been uh, prescribed for us. Like it's not like a set way, a set frequency. So yes, we can. If you would like to partake of it on a daily basis. Now a lot of people talk about it. You know, personally, they, they have communion every day. It's up to each person's conviction and belief. So if you have the faith to do that, then yes. Yeah, Charles, please go ahead. Mine is uh, like we have denominations, maybe um, Baptist, and then we have Anglican, and we have Catholics. 
all believe in, in the Holy Communion, um, can can a, a, a Pentecostal and Anglican com, have a Holy Communion with the Catholics? What's your say? So, uh, see, Charles, we when we explained about the Holy Communion, we said that one this expresses our communion with God. It also expresses our communion with the body. So, uh, as long as people are born again, we can have Holy Communion. It doesn't matter which denomination one belongs to. I hope that answers your question. It does, Pastor. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So I think all the key things have been addressed. All right. So let's move on. We move on to uh, the next chapter here, which is about church discipline. Okay. Uh, church discipline. We're talking about the local church and uh, raising up a strong local church, uh, a local church which will fit into, you know, all the the images. The that's whichever capacity God has called each one of us uh, uh, with. Now, uh, for all. You know, for practically, when we look at raising up this long, strong local church, uh, we will have problems, we will have challenges uh, because we are dealing with people. Okay, uh, there can be external pressures, uh, and that 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 has a way uh, of us responding to it. But internal challenges, internal problems will also be there because. Now we are here working with imperfect people, okay, and we ourselves are also perfect. So we can expect, you know, certain internal uh, problems or issues or challenges to be there. Now, based on the word of God, we have to be prepared to address these matters as well. You know, it's not a surprise. Uh, in fact, I've, I've uh, heard pastors say that. You know, if, if your church is like a 30 member church, it's already hard enough because you have to deal with 30 individuals. Okay, you're, you're uh, trying to work together with 30 people, you're leading 30 people, you want 30 people to be mature. So if the church grows to uh, 50 people, then, you know, you can, uh, uh, you can expect a lot of good things, but at the same time, more challenges because you have an additional 20 people who are part of your congregation and similarly the more number of people we have you know it's a practical thing we know that there are going to be challenges there could be you know uh, issues small and big so we have to be mentally prepared to address it uh, and there can be certain issues where people need to be corrected people need to be uh, uh, you know disciplined now these are these are really uh, hard and difficult uh, things for pastors and leaders to do. So let us just look at the most basic way of uh, resolving uh, an, an issue that occurs between believers, or uh, you know, we could even call it a conflict. What if you know something happens between believers? How would a pastor deal with it? A uh, uh, very common passage is Matthew 18 that uh, a lot of people know Matthew 18 verses 15 through 22 where we are instructed to first if there is an issue with if two believers have an issue the best way is for them to talk go tell your your brother his fault uh, if he hears you you have gained your brother so two believers can talk if there is a problem now if that does not get solved you know then one can have uh, one can engage a another person okay or a mediator somebody who will come and who will speak to both parties and try to make peace uh, among both the people now if, if that does not work then the leader of the church right is is to step in and that person needs to bring resolution to the matter so this is our 
common and a normal progression from Matthew 18, which we must follow. So this is the most basic way in which a, a church leader can go about resolving conflicts. If we hear of two believers having an issue, then you could encourage both of them. Hey, no, why don't the two of you meet? Why don't the two of you discuss? Why don't the two of you clarify and come to a resolution? If that does not happen, the leader can uh, ask for, let's say there's an elder in the church or somebody who both these people respect. Okay, so that person, you can uh, request that person. Okay, this this is the thing that's going on. Why don't you uh, 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 sort of mediate and uh, talk to both the parties and bring peace? Now, even if that does not work, then the leader can step in. And then this leader can step in and then the leader can try to bring resolution to the matter. So uh, that is a common way of sorting out the uh, problems that may arise between believers. Now, uh, all the issues that may come up, they're not that simple. Okay, if uh, this sorts out the matter, well and good. But if it doesn't, right, if the issues are uh, different, and bigger in, in some sense, then there are uh, more instructions that we have from God's word. So what we'll do is since we have uh, completed the time for the first session, let's take a break. Uh, we will come back at 10.02 and we'll continue okay, and look at uh, the other instructions we have for resolving conflicts. Thank you.